was also one of those people that I met very early on getting involved in activism and for myself there's a lot of organization that goes into things like this but the thing that I'm really passionate about is getting out on the streets real grassroots activism getting out there amongst people pushing the buttons and kind of taking risks and Greg is certainly one of the people who um, has gotten out there and taken those risks I think twice I dropped acid with you on the steps yeah. of parliament um, <laughs> There's a very specific reason why that happened and, um, and I'll leave it to Greg to uh, let you know more about why he decided to take acid on the steps of Parliament after emailing all the sitting members to tell them that he was going to do so. Welcome Greg. Thank you. Uh, thanks. So I don't actually have a clicker so I'll just wave when um, uh, the, for the slide. But yeah, I'm, I'm the bastard that drops acid on the steps of Parliament House and annoys politicians who really, really don't want to know about me. So, um, first slide. <laughs> okay, so I have a question for everyone here and that is, do you want to freely, safely and legally use LSD for religious and spiritual purposes? Oh, okay, I might as well go home then. Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. I'm in the right room for a moment there. I thought um, I may not be. So, about me. I'm a mystic. Um, now, that's not making any great, amazing claim. Um, a mystic is a person who experiences divine connection. Now, I experience very powerful states of divine connection um, and I use a lot of LSD to achieve those states of LSD, of, of um, induced mysticism. Um, but it's taken me quite a number of years to get to that point. My actual background uh, is pretty varied. Educationally, a uh, Bachelor of Science, sorry, Bachelor of Arts, Social Science, a Bachelor of Science with uh, honours majoring in Psychology, a Graduate uh, Certificate of Career Education Development, and I'm a careers counsellor and I was a careers counsellor in the university sector before it blew up in my face. I have spent over a decade in the Australian Army. I uh, drove tanks and I was a member of the Army Psychology Corps. I've spent over a decade using psychedelics, um, eight years of drug law reform work, and I'm currently counselling people in need for free and receiving, uh, among other things, a veteran's disability payment. Um, the reality is that when I went public, uh, things went downhill in a big way. I haven't had a proper job since 2010, uh, been unemployed, living below the poverty line. I spent most of the last three years homeless. So I paid a pretty significant price for getting out and doing what um, I believe needs to be done and that is uh, changing the laws so that we can actually use these substances as they're intended to be used. Uh, so 2010, I went public on my personal website, uh, kasarik.com. Uh, I got sick of lying. You know, rock into work. I, you know, I'd have a great trip and, you know, I'd rock into work. And then, what did you do on the weekend? I went on a trip. Oh, where'd you go? I was kind of like, uh, yeah, I can't really tell you that. And so I just got sick of that. So one too many times someone asked me that question. I went home and I thought about, no, I'm just going to change my website. Two weeks later, I was called into the manager's office of the university I was working at and told that they'd bought forward a restructure and that my position was going to be finishing up in... Um, a few weeks time. I was casual at the time, um, make of what you will, but someone then went into the professional association of university careers counsellors and said, do not hire Greg, he's promoting drug use. And that basically brought an end to my university career as a, uh, for careers counsellor. Beginning in 2011, the uh, Australian Federal Attorney General's Department had a wonderful idea of banning every plant that contains psychoactive substances. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not a big fan of cutting down most of the plants in the country, including eucalypts, a whole lot of grasses, the cactuses that um, you know people grow for ornamental purposes. And uh, so there's a big hullabaloo about that. And a lot of people wrote very scientific articles above and beyond my pay grade, as it were, about the stupidity of banning plants because they happen to contain a psychoactive. I was different. I wrote a personal article explaining that I use these substances for religious and spiritual purposes and I was going to keep on using them and I wasn't going to stop. Uh, 2012, uh, if you can go back a bit, sorry. 
2012, um, I actually did a 28 day hunger strike. And um, that went absolutely nowhere because I'm sure pretty much no one except for Nick and Ash know that I've actually done a 28 day hunger strike. Lost 14 kilos doing it. Um, and, um, you know, basically got ignored. Uh, 2000, uh, I've actually got 2012 there, but that's, oh, actually, no, 2012, I did take um, LSD and shrooms on the steps of Parliament House during the um, hunger strike. 2013-14 is when Ash and I and a few others took LSD on the steps of um, um, Parliament House. Also in 2013, I went into three Victorian police stations. Lillardale Police Station on two occasions, Warburton Police Station on one occasion, because I was living up in Warburton, and I said, this is what I do. Feel free to arrest me. And guess what they said? Out. Go, go. We don't want to deal with you. We've got real criminals to bother with. And, you know, and that's the reality. The cops know that we're mostly harmless, as Douglas Adams would say, and they don't have any interest in having to pursue us and pr uh, criminally prosecute us. So, next one, please. Um, in 2015, um, along with Ash and Nick, I founded Community of Infant Colour as a post-dogmatic religious movement. Unfortunately, as any would know, both Nick and Ash are incredibly busy and at the moment it's in abeyance. So... If anyone wants to uh, put their hand up to volunteer to be on a committee, then by all means come and talk to me. 2016, I went to do my tripping on the steps of Parliament House as I'd um, sort of, you know, become a bit of a tradition by then. And this time I got arrested because in previous years what had happened is I'd rock up and the police or the PSAs would say, what are you here for? And I'd be saying, I'm here to take LSD. And they'd go, okay. <laughs> and they'd wander off. So that when at the appointed time when I was going to take the acid, they weren't there. 2016, the PSO went, uh, hang on, I better check on this, and uh, rang a local police sergeant who came along and arrested me. And so I got arrested in front of a group of, I'm guessing, year 10 um, schoolgirls on a school excursion. I've never been arrested before. I've never been in a paddy wagon before. It was an interesting experience. Uh, and the police, you know, we had a great time. We had a great conversation. I explained what I was doing while I was doing it. They said, good on you. Um, and uh, again, so the police are not our enemy. Um, I went to court for that particular charge beginning of 2017 and I wasn't quite successful in arguing my legal argument. And the magistrate found the charges proven because I pleaded guilty and dismissed the charges, meaning I was free to go. But no, I'm a glutton for punishment. So I stood up in court and said, Your Honour, I would just like to inform the court that I'm currently in possession of LSD and if you could organise someone to have me re-arrested, let let's get this Brumby back on the uh, track. And the magistrate looked at me as if I was stark raving mad and I might be um, and said, I'm sure that the police officers uh, who have come here today to testify about your arrest will be more than happy to escort you out. And uh, 2017 in May, on May 4th, which is Star Wars Day, um, for, which I think is pretty auspicious, I was actually successful in arguing my legal case to the magistrate. Now, I didn't get the outcome I was looking for, which was a referral to the Supreme Court, because of one thing. It was just me. And the magistrate said, look, I get where you're coming from. Your use is religious and spiritual and I understand your argument, but you're not important enough. If I put you to the Supreme Court, they'd look at you and go, one person, you're wasting our time, get out of here. So for that reason, again, found guilty and charges dismissed. So on we go. And as someone, someone said at that point, um, you know, Greg, you're pretty fucking badass when it comes to this sort of stuff. And I sort of, yeah, I guess I kind of am. I didn't actually start out meaning to be, but I've kind of ended up that way. So next slide, please. This is, um, uh, there was actually after the first one, a, uh, or first court case, an age reporter. And it says, Greg Kasarik is a drug user, is probably too honest for his own good. And um, that's a picture of me on the steps of Parliament House. So next one. Uh, after the actual... Uh, Second court case, Vice magazine interviewed me and there's me with my now, unfortunately, de deceased golden retriever. 
Um, Sasha, who was an excellent tripping buddy. If you ever want a good tripping buddy, ask your local golden retriever. They are good. Uh, just don't give it to them because that is kind of stupid. Um, so, yes, uh, if we keep them going. So, my objectives are... I'm after regulated access to transcendent compounds for religious and spiritual purposes as required under Section 7 and 14 of the Victorian Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities Act 2007. Oh, sorry, 2006. Now, there are some people who give me a hard time for this. Oh, you're not after recreational use. No, I'm using, I'm after the use that I use it for. I use these substances spiritually and that's what I'm arguing for. You want to argue recreational use? Go for it. It's, you know, by all means do so. But I'm arguing a very specific argument for a very specific reason. So, next slide, please. Now, why, termin why talk about terminology like transcendent compounds? You know, haven't we got enough words for psychedelics, hallucinogens, entheogens, and all the others? Uh, well, not really. Um, basically, I do this because it's a legal term, because I'm dealing with courts of law. So, a transcendent compound is an entheogen, so it is a substance that allows you to experience the divine within. It also is non-addictive, non-toxic and psychologically safe in an appropriate dose set and setting. What this means is the moment someone like a politician says, oh, but it's a, what about addiction? No, sorry. By definition, it's not addictive. Oh, what about overdose? Well, sorry, by definition, it's actually non-toxic. And there's only been one recorded overdose in the entire history of uh, the entire 76 years of uh, LSD. There's only been one recorded overdose death. And um, uh, David Caldecott and I did a back of the uh, envelope calculation a few years ago and we reckon um, he would have taken at least 2,000 tabs. So if you want to take 2,000 tabs, then you're going to have an amazing trip, I suppose. And the transcendent compounds include magic mushrooms, LSD, ayahuasca and um, sacred cactus, which are the ones that we're really mostly using for um, spiritual purposes. Potentially it also does include MDMA, and, uh, but you know, those are the ones that are definitely in. So, next slide please. Um, the Australian Constitution does not help us. A lot of people think it does. Uh, basically, uh, the Commonwealth, section 116 says, the Commonwealth shall not make any law for establishing any religion or for imposing a religious observance or for prohibiting the free exercise of any religion and no religious test shall be required as a qualification for any office or public trust under the Commonwealth. And as I've highlighted there, the word for means that the law actually has to be for targeting religious practice. So in America, if a law trans and, you know, just happens to target religious practice, it's unconstitutional. Unconstitutional. In Australia, you could outlaw hats. Okay, tough luck if you're Jewish and you wear the uh, the cap, or you're the Pope. Um, you can't wear that hat, and the Constitution won't help you. So, next slide, please. In Victoria, though, we do have the Charter of Human Rights Responsibilities Act, which is the one that I'm operating under. It allows us the freedom to de demonstrate his or her religion or belief in worship, observance, practice and teaching either individually as part of a community in public or in private. So when I go and take LSD on the steps of Parliament House, either by myself or with other people, I'm practising my religion in public and as a community or as an individual, allowed under the Charter. So, next slide please. Uh, all rights have corresponding restrictions. But a human right can be subject under law only to such reasonable limits as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society based on human dignity, equality and freedom and take into account all relevant factors. And the Act lists A to E of relevant factors but it doesn't change substantially what's there. So what's demonstrably justifiable? Science. And guess what we've got seven and a half decades worth of? Science. And guess what it says? LSD is non-addictive, non-toxic and psychologically safe in appropriate dose, set and setting. And if anyone knows David Nichols, who happens to be the guru of psychedelic research, he actually put that in paper. So when I went to court, David Nichols, who's now a marriage professor at Purdue University, basically said, yes, these substances are non-addictive, non-toxic and psychologically safe in appropriate dose, set and setting. So the science is 100% on our side. Uh, next slide, please. So this is why they accept the legal argument, because I went in there with, with scientific refer references from David Nichols. 
William Richards, Bill Richards, a lot of people will know, was doing research on psilocybin and uh, LSD before they were made illegal. Um, most people here are going to know um, Rick Doblin, um, founder of one of the founders of MAPS. Uh, our very own Monica Barat, uh, who's a, uh, a common um, site at uh, drug conferences around Australia. Uh, freedom of information requests. I made freedom of information requests to the relevant government departments that revealed that the government has never done any research whatsoever into any of these substances. So that basically means the government don't have anywhere to start with. Um, and history of activism. So I've got my writings, I've got my protest, I've got my website. And the fact that I deliberately had myself arrested once and then re-arrested inside a courtroom, which is actually technically I should have been charged for bringing a prohibited substance into the courtroom, um, but they, the police let me off easy. Um, so all of these reasons, and as I said, the fact that the Victorian law is on our side, are why the judge accepted the legal argument. So next slide, please. The ultimate goal is to obtain a referral to the Supreme Court of Victoria in order to obtain what's called a Declaration of Inconsistent Interpretation under Section 36 of the Victorian Charter. Now, basically, as I said, didn't go to court because it's just me, I'm not important enough. Um, but the thing with the Charter is it's an Act of Parliament, not a constitutional act. So it can be overturned or ignored by politicians. And that's probably what would happen. But the point is it's going to be difficult if a Supreme Court says religious freedom and then the government turn around and say, well, actually, no, we're going to deny these people their religious freedom. Um, so that, that's going to be a difficult case for the government of the day to argue when it does occur. Next slide, please. In other words, the legal argument is sound and the scientific evidence is overwhelming. Okay, but, you know, it can't be just done by one person. Pretty much every time, it doesn't matter what fight you look at for civil rights, whether it's women's suffrage, whether it's the end of slavery, whether it's end of apartheid in South uh, Africa, uh, whether it's gay rights. You know, when I was born, uh, being homosexual was regarded as a mental illness. Now, same-sex couples can get married in this country. These things don't happen because one person stands up and says, I want to do X or have X. These things happen because a group of people come together as a community and work to get the outcome. So, this is an easy win. I've already gone to court and won. I just need the bodies there to demonstrate that this is actually important to people in the community. And if it's not, then I suppose I'll just spend the rest of my life um, uh, tilting windmills. But I kind of think that it is important and I think that uh, if we come together as a community, we can do this. Next slide, please. Now, this is something I've recently been looking into. There's something called the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And it has a, a couple of protocols, optional protocols. Uh, but the Australian government, or Australian as a nation, have signed on to the first optional protocol, which actually sets up an international treaty establishing an individual complaint mechanism for the covenant and there's a case Tuman versus Australia and the case and this is kind of amazing and the case resulted in the repeal of Australia's last sodomy laws when the committee held that sexual orientation was included in the anti-discrimination provisions as a protected status now let's think about that for a second a Tasmanian bloke went to this mob and this mob said to Tasmania, sorry, your laws are in contravene, contravene this. And that was about sodomy, which, you know, globally is still a very, very, um, you know, in a lot of countries, you know, Brunei are starting to kill people. Um, so it's still a very uh, topical thing. So, you know, something as fundamental as religious freedom, um, I'm still looking into this, but um, I think something like this could even be worth a go. Um, anyone has any legal experience or by all means get in touch with me. Um, next slide, please. Um, people talk about the war on drugs. It's actually a war on drug users. Um, no one's ever arrested a mushroom. I've never gone to court and there's a bag of cannabis sitting there in the defence. It's always some poor bastard that's been caught with a, a bag of cannabis. Um, you know, 
The Parliament changes our laws, the parliamentarians are responsible for our laws, and if we demand action, the parliamentarians will actually uh, change our laws as they have in other particular cases. Um, you know, the most recent example obviously being same-sex marriage. So my advice to you is get out, become involved. Join a member of, I would suggest, either the Labor or the Liberal Party um, because they're the ones who are mostly going to make the decision. And I am a card-carrying member of the Liberal Party and people look at me and go, what the hell are you in the Liberal Party for? And sometimes I ask myself the same question. But the reality is that people who are in the Liberal Party need to be exposed to people like me and people like you and they need to recognise that people that use drugs aren't trash. We're functional human beings with real lives and who are paying real costs in terms of stigma and ostracisation and a whole range of other things. So my suggestion is get out, get involved at a local level and obviously get involved with students for sensible drug policy, um, the Australian Psychedelic Society, um, these, these things as well. So next slide, please. So final question. Are you happy to be the permanent target of an irrational, vindictive and politically expedient war on drug users? Oh, thank God for that. Again, I think I'm in the wrong room. Um, no, of course, you, you know, the reality is no one wants to be have a big target painted on their forehead, but pretty much um, that's what happens. That's what we've got and it needs to change. But it won't change until we get together and mobilise and make politicians aware. I invited my local member of parliament and my former member of parliament along tonight. I haven't turned up. I wonder why. Probably because there's no votes in it. Okay, a next slide. So if you want to help with the war on drug users, and this is uh, Eldridge Cle uh, Cleaver, American civil rights activist and leader, and he said, there is no more neutrality in the world. You either have to be part of the solution or you're going to be part of the problem. And, you know, if you go home tonight and sit on your you know, turn on Netflix, don't do a damn thing, then I'm going to suggest that you're part of the problem, okay, because nothing's going to change. Um, the pipe has got to be paid and um, we're the ones to pay it. So, yeah, thank you very much for your time. And uh, I'll hand back to Ash. Right. <laughs> you're right. Thank you, Greg. Um, I gave a talk at Rainbow Serpent in 2017 on cognitive liberty and um, it's kind of one of those nuanced topics that's maybe not the kind of topic that's going to win the mainstream, but it's in line with exactly what Greg was doing. You know, I find it abhorrent that um, my source of spiritual insight, potentially yours as well, is criminalised. We protect the right to people to go to church, to go to their mosque, to go to their synagogue, yet if you decide to consume a small innocuous plant you risk uh, severe penalties for that. And um, <clears throat> the question that I ask people there, and it's maybe one that you guys might like to consider just to think about the significance of that question. The question that I asked was, is your right to take psychedelics as important to you as to freely choose a sexual partner, a consenting sexual partner? Is your sexuality the same as your right to explore your own mind? Now, I'll just leave you with that to consider. One of the things that Greg did, um, mention is um, getting involved, participating. So before